we are now at the uh, stage where we will um, begin the session two of uh, our IOSIS book launch. Um, and uh, at IOSIS we decided uh, that in the future, as today, uh, and Dr. Uh, Peter Villiers already said that, uh, that, that one of the books published uh, during the time before we have our next launch, we're going to decide which one of the books we would like to have a discussion in a, in a, uh, in a form of a short symposium afterwards. Because at this uh, enterprise, this is scholarly books, and it is all also to uh, serve the academy. Um, we decided this year, and it was not difficult, to decide that this particular book is the one that we would like uh, to discuss for this the, uh, during this symposium, and that is the that is the book of um, uh, Kubis Kreia. Uh, the program will be, and you will see on what you have there, and the program will be that uh, uh, Professor Johan Beitendag. Uh, in a moment, I will introduce a little bit and say a little bit more about Professor Johan Beidendag. He will introduce Professor Creer, um, and the reason for that is that uh, Professor Creer uh, is uh, the research associate of Professor Beidendag um, in the Department of Systematic Theology and Ethics here at the University of Pretoria, and they are working very closely in collaboration. Uh, but also because of Professor Beitenhardt as the current Dean of the Faculty of, of Theology. Um, he will introduce Professor uh, uh, Creer. Uh, Professor Creer will, through discussing a few slides and, this, and go through what he would like to say about his book. Uh, and afterwards there will be two respondents. The one will be Professor Michelle Tasquin Johnson. Uh, I will now say a little bit more about his affiliation. Uh, not only a colleague and friend of um, Professor Kubis Creer, he's from the Department of Religious Studies in Arabic at the University of South Africa. Um, he will have, will have an opportunity for about 10 minutes of response to what Professor Creer is, is say, uh, going to say to us, and then Professor Yaku Bayer. Uh, professor Jakob Beyers is a professor in science of religion and missiology and the program manager of the biblical and religious studies here at the University of Pretoria attached to the Faculty of Theology. Um, and uh, without uh, further acknowledgement, they will, Professor Michel Klaatskun uh, Johnson and uh, Jakob Beyers will come forward uh, as respondents. And if we still have time, uh, because we are stick to uh, that we try to complete our uh, ceremony at two o'clock, um, uh, there will be, uh, and I hope there will be time, but we still let me see for a, um, maybe a response or question or remark from the audience. Um, Professor Creer, uh, and not in, in, in a sense of introduction, but as the chief editor of the IOS Scholarly Books, the book that he wrote, and we already um, give him the acknowledgement during the launch of the books. Um, but this is really a remarkable book. Uh, and uh, we are so delighted that we could have him on board uh, and the diocese um, is privileged uh, to publish uh, this particular book. Professor Johan Beitendag, uh, it is a centenary celebration also of the Faculty of Theology uh, at Victoria University and it is uh, not, especially now because it is not part of the centenary, but it is uh, because of, this, of, of the centenary. Uh, really nice that you, as a research associate and fellow of Richard Creer, 
uh, can be here today. Uh, we know you are actually with sabbatical and still uh, that it is so important for you. We are very, very pleased by that. And also because of uh, it is one of those very last formal uh, ceremonies also, not only as a research fellow, but as dean of this faculty at Pretoria University, because you are also uh, in the point of um, terminating the term of uh, your deanship at uh, Pretoria University. But I would like uh, to you to call on Pardon you to introduce uh, Professor Creer to us, please. Thank you. <coughs> Program Director, Professor Van Aarde, Dr. Peter Villiers, the Managing Director of AOSIS, all the laureates of this morning, Professor Quivis Creer, ladies and gentlemen, it's really a privilege for me this afternoon to introduce to you our guest of honor, Professor Quivis Creer. Normally, when people fulfill this sort of duty, they say it's a privilege and an honor, and of course it is. It's a very honor for me to do it this afternoon. But it's not a sort of a customary introduction that I'm doing now. It comes from the depths of my heart. Professor Kobe's career is not only, and if I may say you're a very good friend of mine, at least a very good colleague, he has influenced my life, my theology, and even more important so. He helped me to revisit the DNA of our Faculty of Theology at this university. I can remember at least two, but I expect three, Le Gottlis, where he was a special guest guiding my colleagues in the faculty what we are to become, as from next year, a faculty of theology and religion. And we relied so much on the insights of Quivis Creer. And therefore, and I'm very happy, Andre has just mentioned the uh, centenary of our faculty, and we've got a very, and it's actually a pity that there aren't a uh, number of these books here this afternoon of our so-called coffee table publication commemorating our centenary. And he contributed the pivotal article to that book as well. And that, of course, on invitation, indicates you know, how important Quibus Creer's insights on religion are for not only me, but for our faculty. Therefore, I really want to share with you a little bit of his background, which I think is very important. You know, in terms of listening to him, evaluating what he's going to say, and of course, appreciating the book that he has just published. Kubis Creer's life and academic career revolve around the study of mysticism. He studied Christian theology at the University of Pretoria, where he obtained the degrees BA, BD, honors in Latin and philosophy. His first piece of academic research was a study of the medieval mystic Thomas A. Kempis. From 64 to 67, he continued his studies at the Free University of Amsterdam, where he obtained the degree Doctorandus Theologia. His doctoral thesis, DD Unisa 1972, dealt with the theology of the Swiss Christian theologian Karl Barth. But this reading of Barth convinced him that the traditional approach was to be overhauled completely. And I can completely associate myself because this is more or less my own personal history and journey in theology. This led to the theoretical and historical exploration of the mystical journey in various religions and outside institutionalized religion with particular focus on Christianity and Buddhism. From 1968 to 71, he served as a minister of the D 
DRC congregation of St. West Pretoria. In 1972, he joined the staff of the University of South Africa, lecturing in systematic theology, my subject, a senior lecturer and associate professor. Gradually, his academic work shifted from systematic theology to religious studies. From 1982 to his retirement in 2005, he was professor in religious studies and chairman of the Department of Religious Studies at UNISA. He was a member of the ministerial committee developing the policy on religion in education, 2003, and of the committee introducing religious studies as part of the national curriculum in the two subjects, life orientation and religion studies. What an important contribution he made there. He taught Buddhist history and philosophy at the African Buddhist Seminary of Nan Hua Temple in Bronco Spirit, and is presently Emeritus Professor and Research Fellow at UNISA, the University of Pretoria, obviously, and then the University of the Free State. Throughout his main interest has been the development of a framework that would accommodate all religions understood as the human being's need for radical and comprehensive orientation in the universe, with mysticism as a deepest dimension, and to do that in one theoretical framework of understanding. It's a little bit of a Leiden sentence, and I want to read it again. Is that throughout his main interest has been the development of a framework that would accommodate all religions, understood as the human being's need for radical and comprehensive orientation in the universe, with mysticism as a deepest dimension in one theoretical framework of understanding. And people who know me know that I say theology is nothing but an endeavor to come to grips with reality. Little tale in a manner that matters. He's published at least 16 books, and I know it's going to take a lot of time to take you through all of these books, but I do want to give you a sort of a bird's eye view. The first book was published in 1979, and as you see in the last one, in 2017. The first book, Aandag, but just listen to the topics every time. The first book, Aandag, Kalamte in Uit in Insig, a uiteensetting van Theravada Buddhistische Meditatie aan die hand van die Ma Satipatthansa Sutta. 1982, Studying Religion, a Methodological Introduction to Science of Religion. 1989, Metatheism, Early Buddhism and Traditional Christian Theism. 1991, Buddhism from the Buddha to Asoka. 1995, Long Ages, Religion in South Africa, Bushman, Christian, Buddhist. 1999, Skeptisch Kip Leeg, and other frühe Buddhistische Gedichte. 2000, Die Weg van Meditatie, a frühe Buddhistische Handleiding. 2001, Mindfulness, Meditation, and Early Buddhist Prescription. 2002, Spoor. Religieus Academische Stap Toch Dier een Kwart Eeuw. 2003, Duister Stilte in Wilde Woestijn, Die Mystiek van Jan van Riesbroek. 2003, and all the Pretoria people would like this title, Sweeping Whirlwinds, A Study of Religious Change, Reformed Religion and Civil Religion in the City of Pretoria. 2004, Godelijke Oneindigheid, die religieuze metafysica van Gordano Bruno. 2006, Sounding Unsound, beautiful, Orientation into Mysticism. 2007, Turning Points in Buddhist Meditation and Philosophy. 2009, The Human Search for Meaning, a multi-religion introduction to the religions of humankind. And then in 2013, a very important book, Dante, Semistica Reis, Eerste Toch, Inferno. 
En nie weet, daar gaan nog twee, een derde top ook wees. Professor Kobus Kruger, we are so honored to have you this afternoon here. And I really think, you know, for IOSIS to publish this very important book, and an author of your international caliber is, of course, something very much commendable. I introduce him to the audience, and we're looking forward to what you're going to offer us this afternoon. I thank you. Um, dear friends, what a privilege for me to stand here this afternoon. Professor Beutendag, thank you for your kind words. I deeply appreciate the interruption of your sabbatical to be present here today. And I must add that your vision and leadership at the present time of new beginnings are keenly observed and appreciated. Professor van Aarde, thank you for your broad and inclusive approach to the field of religion and theology and your care during the publication process of this book. Dr. de Villiers, thank you for publishing this manuscript. I deeply appreciate that. Working with you <coughs> and your competent and friendly staff was truly an enriching experience. And your role in collaboration with the University of Pretoria in raising the standard of academic publications in South Africa deserves the respect it enjoys. And as I speak, and I see them before me as I speak, the circle of friends in Pali, Kalyana Mita, who gathered at our home one morning a week for seven years to read the Dhammapada. That was a, a life-changing experience. We welcomed many visitors, many participants for shorter periods. However, may I mention by name those who took part for several years, in some cases all seven of them. And I see them sitting around the table at our home. Cheryl and Johan Herold, Willy and Gerda Potgieter, Helen Ter Blanche, Hildegard Behrens, Johan Kleinans, Johannes de Villiers, Piet Muller, Peter Erasmus, and my wife Christina. Thank you for an unforgettable reading experience and for your contribution in understanding the ancient book. The growth of the ideas behind this book go back many long years and along that way I enjoy the understanding and support of my family, of friends and colleagues, often extended over decades. You know how highly I treasure you. Now the Dhammapada is a collection of 423 verses written down on palm leaves in the first century before the common era, but in essence going back to the words of Siddhartha Gautama round about the fifth, sixth centuries before the common era. Allow me to start um, by giving you, by reading a verse from the Dhammapada to convey something of a sense of the sound of the old document. It's verse 387. Diva tapati adicho rating abati chandima sanyado katio tapati jai tapati brahmano ata sabang ahorating buddho tapati tejasa my attempt at an Afrikaans version is Bedachs skeni son Snachs glim die maan Bewapen blinke krijger Mediterend gloei je edelmens Maar immer dag en nacht skitter die verlichte 
So by day the sun glows, at night the moon glows, the armed warrior glows, but day and night the enlightened glows. And that's quintessential Buddhism in my <coughs> view. The grandeur of nature exemplified by sun and moon is impressive to the human observer. Even more so the mesmerizing glamour of human social status and power. But both fail in the presence of a noble human being, a Brahmano, meditating quietly. Reaching beyond the glories of nature and conventional human society is the subtle splendor of the solitary figure of an enlightened human person beyond even the gods. Now, why in Afrikaans? There are several reasons why I translated this ancient treasure, treasure into Afrikaans. Firstly, Afrikaans belongs to the same linguistic family tree as the, as the classical European languages, Greek and Latin, and the classical Indian languages, Sanskrit and Pali. So just exploring the relationship of grammatical structure and texture and vocabulary was enormous joy. Just one example, the Pali word pitar, the English word father, the Afrikaans word father, of family, close, close family relations. Secondly, in a wider sense, Afrikaans finds itself in a state of serious crisis, shocked into realizing the fundamental truths of the evanescence <coughs> of all things, the depth of human error and the suffering as a result of that. And those are the basic themes addressed in Theravada scriptures and they speak to the Afrikaans situation today. So what, from a classic Theravada perspective, could it mean to speak Afrikaans in present-day South Africa? Thirdly, since its birth in South Africa, Afrikaans was essentially, in my view, a bridge of communication, connecting indigenous African culture particularly Khoisan, European culture through Dutch, French, German, and Eastern Malaysian Muslim culture. So extending this bridge of communication and understanding to the Indian subcontinent, discovering and forging new connections into a new landscape was not only great fun, <coughs> but seemed to me be in line with the original inherent logic of Afrikaans. It is still a young, developing vehicle of communication, and the Dhammapada provided a magnificent opportunity and challenge to explore new cultural and religious territory, enriching the scope and depth of Afrikaans for the benefit of the country and our continent as a whole. What I attempted was not a free translation at all, in the sense of loosely staying in touch with the original, yet in fact intended to be a literary achievement of my own. It was not that. My translation strategy was conservative, staying as close to the original as possible, yet making the inevitable and necessary compromises to communicate across really vast gulfs of time space and culture. It's not a poetic translation either, but one staying close to spoken language, but with a certain sense, nevertheless, I hope, of sound and rhythm. And this, I trusted, would be in line with the spirit of the old verses. Pali poetry is a complex field. In some respects, no doubt, comparable to Greek poetry of that same period but differing in one essential dimension. The Pali poets of old were not breastfed on Mount Parnassus, claiming divine inspiration, and they were not famous, their foreheads adorned with wreaths of laurel. These unknown poets 
wanted to be nothing more than anonymous monks, carrying the message of non-permanence and non-substance and absolute emptiness and their moral implications of non-greed and non-hatred and non-violence taught by their teacher. So allow me to introduce another verse. 363. This is a portrait of a good monk by another monk, an aesthetically accomplished one. And there it is said, Soot is the taal van a monarch wat beheers in spraak, nederig en met inzicht praat, en die boodskap in sy strekking, so verhelder. This is really a self-portrait of the poet monk speaking here. All the emphasis is on the quiet inner quality of the communicator. The restraint, moderation, humility, clarity of speech, his full comprehension of what is at stake and of the profound and far-reaching implications of his words. So the verses translated are accompanied by interpretive commentary and at times quite lengthy excursions in a style that I term tendential interpretation. And here I moved quite freely. The best way to indigenize a foreign plant, and this is foreign, would not be to uproot a fully grown plant from its own soil to stick it in the ground in another environment, but to take a handful of seeds, to look at them, to weigh them in your hand, to feel their texture, smell them, then sow them in the new environment in soil that you know and understand and watch and tend them as they grow. That is what I attempted to do with the original Pali word seeds and conceptual seeds, trusting that they could grow into Afrikaans Theravada, so to speak. Yet it was emphatically not done in a propagandistic style, for the path of truth in line with the Dhammapada leads towards and peters out in silence. In the Dhammapada, I do not engage in historical criticism in a strict sense. What was historical fact, anecdote or mythopoetic fiction around the Buddha wasn't really relevant to the argument. Nor did I engage in textual criticism, the history of the canon formation or the history of Buddhist philosophy in general. But it did, did attempt to do justice to the text in its distant historical context, taking care not to conflate that simplistically with the present. In addition, I attempted to understand the conscious, deliberate, intentional structure of the old book, and to discover, if possible, the wider implied metaphysical mystical tendency of the book underlying the text, perhaps not articulated explicitly in the text itself. So why bother with this ancient distant Buddhist text? So I, I might say something about my own experience. I started moving in this direction in the late 1960s, early 1970s, when morally and intellectually and practically, the writing on the wall as far as apartheid was concerned was clear for all to see. Seeing through that political system was, in, was the easy part. And I got through that, got over that quickly. The more difficult part was how to relate to the church, the specific tradition and the religion as a whole <coughs> that seemed to somehow have made that possible. That took much longer. Was domination and power perhaps subtly ingrained in the structure of theism as such? In the case of Christianity, going back to ancient patriarchal Semitic patterns of thought, 
and taking final shape in the Roman Empire in competition with the Roman Empire, adopting some features from the Roman Empire and eventually outlasting the Roman Empire. If so, was there a way out, perhaps leading to an open beyond? So I find, found myself in a process of tumbling dominoes, leaving no absolutistic claim to truth and power standing. However, the outcome was not angry, atheism or anything of the kind, but a discovery of the mystical depth present in all religion, like a deeply hidden, clear pool. So in the middle 1970s, I encountered Buddhism and Taoism, which seemed worth exploring, and it became a journey of rich discovery. So I gradually, that's beyond, sorry, I, I don't want to elaborate this, but that's what lies behind this. I gradually came to a position where firstly, I entered the schools of the most profoundly thinking, the most inclusively loving spirits of humankind as a whole. I would not submit blindly to and follow any, but enter into a receptive and weighing, critical weighing relationship with at least some of them as far as I could have access to them and as far as possible. Secondly, I became interested in such teachings in all their stages and forms, poetry, stories, and yet even scholasticism with its passion for intellectual precision and comprehensiveness. That, that is beautiful. But I turned away from attitudes and formulas claiming to capture absolute truth finally and sense that the most profound understanding has experience of unsound beyond all words, concepts and intellectual schemes at the utter limit of human capability. And thirdly, I turned away from conformist compliance to the demands of any power-oriented religious institution, preferring the free company of noble friends outside all camps. I would now like to say something about the wider theoretical space. Throughout this whole exploratory journey where Buddhism and Christianity and other religions meet, a certain mental picture kept recurring in my mind. Imagine ex an extraordinary high majestic mountain peak from that supreme height, a few imagined travelers on Hoer Kauer Paya, higher called the paths, to quote Van Weyck Low, oversee, do I still have a, oversee a, a vast landscape, the panorama of the totality that is, or as close to that as is humanly possible. We could also imagine those great quiet ones without acrophobia at the top, peering ahead as far as the human eye can reach and sensing rather than seeing an absolute horizon, a gezichtseinder, so distant one cannot assume there must be camels on the other side, so inaccessibly, uncrossably distant that the panorama simply peters out blending with empty sky. And yet, imagine right in front of our imagined great visionary, so close he or she can touch it lovingly, a single lily, in all its contingent humble splendor, lovable, not in spite of it being here today and gone tomorrow, but because of that. So precious are the bird in the air and the lily in the field, the newly born baby and the old person close to death, a language and a culture as well as a religion and a religious institution grown over time with its flowers in summer and its withered leaves in winter. Each being, including each religion, is unique 
and precious in its own right, but none is absolute. They are all comparable, each and all together, and mutually, mutually implicitly. That's a very important point. They are mutually implicitly part of the one vast totality of the cosmic landscape. All arising from, constantly arising on, constantly disappearing on the subtle, all relativizing, yet all encompassing horizon. All are subject to the basic law of appearance, growth, decay and disappearance. Part of the vast landscape in the embrace of the empty and emptying horizon. And that's what the Dhammapada is essentially about. May I use the analogy of a mountain again in a slightly different sense. At the top are the great solitary ones. Yes, ones. The Pali word is eko, which I translated as ienlang, alienlang. With true insight into the depth of things, with panoramic vision and universal love, I do not imagine any one of such beacons of light clamoring for, claiming exclusive truth and absolute power. I imagine such great religious, mystical ones to be clothed with quiet dignity and inner authority, communicating not triumphantly but selflessly between their words and in their words, silence. So laboring up and down the steep slopes are those such as religious intellectuals who may suspect the great panorama but perhaps not quite, who may not have seen it yet or attained the ultimate vision and peace. And on the plateaus and in the lower valleys lie the precious villages where people are born, live and die like birds and lilies, yet seeking meaning in religions. The art of mystical mountaineering would be to climb as high as possible, to see as wide as possible, and yet not to denigrate, but to respect every single flower or religion, simply because they are and have managed to survive. Also not to lose touch with village life in the valley, to knowingly take leave of it and precisely because of that to return to it in love and solidarity. So the exercise engaged in in this translation was not a religious one in the sense of subscribing to or prescribing any one of the historical religions. It does not prescribe encapsulation in any closed exclusive religious system. It does not reduce any religion as a set of beliefs to any other one, but respects and upholds real differences. It does not mix and match various religions, but seeks an integral understanding. It does not engage in religious tourism, either as guide or tourist does not seek merely compare religions, establishing similarities and differences, and that's that, but seeks the meta-religious space beyond all. So I have the sense of a beautiful wilderness um, without any set roots. One may wander into that, filled with curiosity and a fascination and a sense of adventure. One may find one's own way in accordance with the landscape and the availability of nourishment and one's inner sense of direction. Others have traveled this landscape before us, these, these people, and we can pick up their tracks and reconstruct and understand their historical roots. So the book attempts to overcome religious apartheid and the Dhammapada beckons us into a meta-dimension where all religions peter out in silence and from where all arise. So perhaps just in conclusion, just one short verse perhaps. Partei besef nie, ons kom almal hier tot einde nie. 
Maar wie dit besef, zijn twisten komt tot een einde. Dat applies to religions as well. Thank you, Kubis. Michelle, um, you can come forward, please. Where is Michelle? She's coming. And then Jaco, uh, with Elder, the announcement, please. Michelle, please. Thank okay for <coughs> you. Professors, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, Thank you for having me here to speak to Corbus, Corbus's book. And also, hello YouTube. Uh, can I take you back for a moment? 1987, 30 years ago. Wow, different world. In 1987, I was a second year UNISA student in Cape Town. And, you know, in those days, we didn't have uh, much internet, so the lecturers would come down to Cape Town, what we called group visits. And in 1987, I met Corbus. And I shamelessly curried favor by taking all the uh, lecturers to the airport. I told them, no, it's on my way, I lied. <laughs> uh, two years later, I was about to graduate, and Corbus offered me a job at UNISA. Uh, yeah, I didn't have a master's degree, I didn't have an honors degree, I just had a BA and he gave me a job, two mornings a week. Now if you kept up on multiverse theory, in that moment, Kubis created an entire universe in which a Professor Claspin Johnson exists. It's the only mistake I've ever known him to make, but it was a big one. <laughs> Corbus is not just an academic who writes about mysticism. He is himself a mystic. And in that, I was never able to follow him. Because I'm a flat-footed Dutchman. I'm a naive realist. And despite that, he was able to guide me into academia and allow me to find my own space. You can ask any of Kurbis's students. He's not interested in creating mini-me's. He's not in interested in creating uh, a legion of Kurbis juniors. Every student that he's had has found his own space. So I've known Kurbis for 30 years. And I've been here for 30 years long, years ago. For the gemak wanneer hij nieuwe talen kan aanleren. Hij heeft de vertaling gedaan van Dante. Oh, maar als je in middle eerste Italiaans moet aanleren, geen probleem niet. En voor dit, uh, middle eerste Vlaams, Pali, ik was altijd bij jaloers op hem. Maar die taal waar nou hij elke keer terugkeert, is Afrikaans. En ik denk, in hierdie tijd is dit iets waarvoor ons werkelijk dankbaar moet wees. Dat daar nog mensen is zoals Kobus, wat nog altijd bereid is om in Afrikaans te werken. Om Afrikaans verder in die wereld van denken te brengen. Oké, okay, de Dhammapada, as you've heard from Kobus. 423 verses. So let's start with verse 1 and work our way up. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to do that. You have to buy the book. But I'm going to do one verse. Can I do one verse? Please. Chapter 8, verse 100. Better than a thousand useless words is a single word that when you hear it, it brings peace. Now, the Dhammapada is what we call wisdom literature. In biblical terms, it's the equivalent of Proverbs or Ecclesiastes. And the funny thing about wisdom 
literature is you don't need to belong to that religion to appreciate it. You don't need to be Christian to read Proverbs and say, wow, there's depth in here. You just need to be human. And the same is true of the Dhammapada. Every line in it is a tiny little jewel, one beautiful thought. You do not need to be a Buddhist to see it, to appreciate it. You won't become a Buddhist from reading it. It just speaks to the human condition. Now, I've actually read Corbus's book because it's I was one of the reviewers. I'm sorry. Am I allowed to say that now? No, but okay. Okay. <laughs> Blind peer reviews over, so. And uh, so, let me just repeat that line. Better than a thousand wor useless words is a single word that when you hear it, brings peace. We are academics we produce words. That's our product. And let's face it, a lot of the words we produce are useless. You spend uh, four, five, six years on your PhD, and if you're lucky, 12 people in the world are ever going to read it from cover to cover. And you spend months working on an article, and wow, somebody cited me. So, there are many words in Corbus's book. There are no useless words in Corbus's book. Leid die ding af, koop om, lees om. Corbus, thank you for never retiring. Yeah. Because what you have given us since you retired has been of unbelievable value. <coughs> Thank you. Um, while Yaku is coming forward, um, please remember, you do not need to buy Kubus book. You can download it free and read every single verse uh, of the Dhammapada free and experience the richness of uh, the Dhammapada. Kub has already um, submitted a new book and uh, international domain of the editorial board uh, accepted it and it will be about silence and metaphysics and we are waiting, uh, I personally as uh, editor, uh, to have that book in my hand when the final manuscript will be submitted in the coming months. Yaku, please. Ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed a, a privilege, yes, the word that Dean used, a privilege here to speak today in that sense uh, to, yeah, at the day of the presentation of, uh, of this book by Professor Kruger, it is my privilege to share a podium with him. Professor Kruger, it is for me a very important to say something about this book. Only a couple of uh, ideas from my side. In 1953, the German philosopher Karl Jaspers wrote the book entitled The Origin and Goal of History. Now in this book, originally published in German in uh, 1949, he stated his theory as to the existence of what he referred to as an actual age, a, a period during which patterns of thought in different cultural centers around the world simultaneously developed to such an extent that the result was the emergence of prominent religions still existing today. Now, in explaining this phenomenon of the actual age, Jaspers explains how these religions developed due to the particular way in which the relationship, the configuration between matter and spirit is viewed. Matter and spirit are, in this case, metaphoric ex descriptions of the relation between humans and transcendence. Now, the theologian Keith Ward describes six possible configurations in which matter and spirit can relate. 
Now, these six configurations uh, are dualism, monism, idealism, theism, reductive materialism, and of course, emergent materialism. Now, for the purpose of our discussion, I'll only expand on two of these particular configurations, namely the first one, dualism. Now, in this model of dualism, the relationship between matter and spirit is seen as two opposing independent entities. Both matter and spirit is not dependent on the other for origin or for survival. Humans are in essence a mixture of matter and spirit. The human aspiration of enhanced spiritual existence is in fact an effort to liberate oneself from matter. Now Keith Ward in his assessment uh, of, of these configurations places Theravada Buddhism as an example of exactly this dualistic existence. All effort taking place in the material body, this body we have, all effort is in fact an effort to reach the spiritual realm of nirvana. So there, there is thus a distinction and separation between matter and spirit. The second model I want to elaborate a bit on is uh, theism, only one of these six configurations. Theism, on the other hand, in this mod model, matter and spirit can be distinguished but not separated as matter is dependent on spirit for its existence spirit has an influence on and may even determine all that happens in the material world spirit can even grant material an independent existence these are forms of theism now Ward, Keith Ward, places the Semitic religious traditions within this particular category. This would imply that the religions Judaism, Christianity and Islam have a similar understanding of at least, of at least, the relation between spirit and matter. Now, of the, these six configurations, only the first four, namely dualism, monism, idealism and theism, are prevalent within this development of religions known as during the actual age. Now, for our purpose, I'm only discussing the first and the fourth of these configurations. Now, the Dhammapada reflects the wisdom within Theravada Buddhism. The understanding of matter and spirit is therefore dualistic. Christianity, as Islam and Judaism, are more at home within the theistic model. Two different models emerging during the so-called actual age. Now, does it then mean these models have nothing in common? Or does it in fact mean they have everything in common? Now, the, the purpose of the book by Professor Kruger is not to discuss similarities or differences between Christianity and Theravada Buddhism. As he states in the introduction of his book, and I quote from his book just to entice you to, to actually read it, Buddhism in Christendom is dus uit die gezichtsoek van hier die werk nie vijhandige of wantrouwige concurrenten oor een lang afstand, of misschien daarom hoffelijke gespreksgenote met veilige spaties tussen hulle nie, maar verwante met veel wat ooreenkom. Keurig Afrikaans. But, but, but Kruger continues when he states also in the introduction, toch is daar ook betekenisvolle verskille tussen Theravada, om vir die oomlik by hier die vertakking te bly, en Christendom. The result is however not a comparative study of differences and similarities between Christianity and Buddhism. But then, so what is then the purpose of the book? Once again, Professor Kruger states in the introduction, highlighting this purpose then at least, in this book wordt nie uitgebreid op ooreenkomste en verskille in sentiment en segging tussen die twee religieën in gegaan nie. Wat ek wel voorop wil stel, is dat al by hier waardeer word as uitinge van die selfde universele religieuze hunkering wat in laaste instantie afspeel in die weie ruimte van mystiek. There are many lenses through which one can view the relations between religions. In the publication I had the privilege to edit, uh, that was also presented earlier today, I utilized the lens of theology 
as a way of understanding the way in which theistic religions meet. Now, Professor Kruger, in his wonderful work, utilized the lens of mysticism to view the relation between Christianity and Buddhism. A lens is not a value-laden instrument. In fact, a lens is merely an instrument. And therefore, the lens of mysticism is not a judgmental treatment of the relationship, but merely an instrument to enrich and to enhance our understanding of the other. It is indeed wonderful to read the Dhammapada in Afrikaans, the first language in Africa. Yes, as, as Professor Kruger indicates in the introduction, the first language in Africa into which the Dhammapada is translated. Indeed, a noteworthy achievement one can only expect from such a highly esteemed scholar as Professor Kruger. Professor Kruger, congratulations on the publication of this book, a work indeed, as you describe, which began in 1998. The original work started then. And was interrupted for a decade and taken up again in 2010 and completed in its final form in 2017 to the benefit of the learning and scholarly community seeking wisdom. Thank you for your perseverance. Thank you. Uh, friends, uh, we will unfortunately not have time for discussion. Um, before I ask uh, for, uh, uh, Dr. Pierre de Villiers for the closing of our day, uh, from my side I need to say that what happened this afternoon is uh, not something by coincidence, it is in a sense a spiritual experience um, and we did not decide uh, to have a discussion on the Dhammapada uh, because of the centennial celebration of the Faculty of Theology um, at Pretoria. But it is uh, simultaneously what is busy happening in our faculty. Professor Johan Beitenau referred to that, uh, that Professor Creer was involved in all the discussions that we had in the transforming of this faculty uh, for the future and also the restructuring of the academic curricula uh, and the change of the name of this faculty that is now theology and religion. It also causes that I as the chief editor of HTS Theological Studies Establish a new series, Society and Religion, and we already had two manuscripts uh, that will be published next year in the series of Society and Religion. And what is busy happening is the beginning of a pilgrimage. Uh, a pilgrimage of a new journey at the University of Pretoria. Uh, a journey that need, doesn't need to threaten anyone. Uh, it's actually a journey that way we can be enriched in terms of one's own position, disposition in terms of your own religious convictions, but be enriched uh, now also in terms of other religions in other religious traditions. We have, uh, we have had for so many years uh, at this faculty a department of science of religion where we study the theology of religions and we had this wonderful book of Kubis von Jakob Beyer um, that actually commemorates also this tradition in our faculty of a theology of religions of encountering of different religions. Now the new pilgrimage, the new journey is to bring in seriously the aspect of mysticism. Uh, mysticism that will ask for theologians to be humble, um, to know what the, really the benefit is of silence, uh, to s know that you can be engaged with the other disciplines as well as other religions. And for that, I think it was really wonderful that we really could have the Dhammapada today as a discussion for the symposium and for the future that I am very 
very positive for a promising future of theology and religion in the future at this university. Dr. Pierre de Villiers, please. Ladies and gentlemen, it is then my pleasure to close this symposium by saying a few last words. First of all, Kubis, this was really an enriching experience for me to listen to your presentation today. When I'm a medical man, I know nothing about religions and theology, but it really stirred me. Thank you very much. Uh, I didn't think at my age I can still be stirred, but there you are. Um, I also, before we end off, I would like to um, thank two people, a few other people, but two special people, staff members of the University of Pretoria that should be thanked. Arista and Christine, please just come forward so that people can see who you are. <laughs> Christine Nell, who is the, uh, can I say, coordinator uh, or representative of the Faculty of Theology at the library. There you are. <laughs> she played a huge role with Lynette to coordinate this event. So, great thanks to Christine. And she told me when we walked in here, she showed me that the books is already uploaded in the catalogue at the university. So you can find it in your library already. Then Carista van der Merwe, our uh, start marker, shall I say. I don't know the real good English word for that. Uh, here at the faculty to assist us with RTS and also now with this event. Thank you very much for your labor. I know they ran around with boxes and cartons and tried to organize everything. Thank you. We appreciate that. <laughs> then, of course, have you seen the beautiful flowers? Mm. I was absolutely amazed. The food for me was wonderful. I hope you enjoyed it. And I also want to thank those people in their absence for for this. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your presence here, because without you this wouldn't have been possible. Thank you to our authors and to our editors who made this possible. But most of all, I would say behind the background, we don't see them. There are many people laboring every day, uh, particularly the staff at our houses, also the people here who assisted us. A big thank you for them as well. Please be safe, go home and enjoy the rest of the day.